today I would like to discuss Martin Luther King Jr. Now, my original thought for this video was to read one of his speeches. One of his most famous and well-known speeches is the I Have a Dream speech. However, I had wanted to read the speech called I've Been to the Mountaintop. And that is actually the last speech he had ever given. And it actually is a very beautiful speech. But <laughs> there might be some weird copyright things with that, and I didn't want to risk it. So I do recommend you checking out that speech if you're interested. I've been to the mountaintop. However, because of the copyright, I decided to not read that to you today to commemorate Martin Luther King Jr. Then my next thought was to discuss bits of his life, and I wanted to kind of have from early childhood up till adulthood to describe some of the wonderful things that he had done in his lifetime. However, when I was researching his life, there is a lot of ambiguity with certain aspects of his life. The facts don't always match, <laughs> depending on what source you use. Of course, you have to be careful of whatever source you're using when you're doing research, especially secondary sources. It's always kind of a hit or miss with what you're getting. A lot of people <laughs> may write things maybe from memory or they don't have accurate facts or it's hard to know who's telling the truth, essentially. So I was going to do the best I can to let you know some of the facts, just a few of the facts that I found. I actually had written on a whole bunch, <laughs> whole bunch of notes front and back from different sources that I was going to go over with you, but because of the source material being a little iffy and some of the facts being a little iffy, I was just going to go over a couple of things to discuss him and then I was kind of wanting go over activism in general and activists and kind of how that tends to play out for any type of activist, not just a civil rights leader. Now, if you live in the United States, you know that we have a Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Martin Luther King Jr. Day is celebrated every third Monday of January, and that is a federally mandated holiday. Dr. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, actually advocated for that day to exist. President Ronald Reagan made it a federal holiday in 1983, and it wasn't celebrated for the first time until 1986. We do still celebrate this man today, every third Monday of January. For his activism, particularly surrounding civil rights for Black Americans. Now some facts about Martin Luther King Jr. Include. He was born on January 15th, 1929. January 15th, 1929. The third Monday of every January does not always fall on his birthday, the 15th. However, it falls usually somewhere close to his birthday. So because he was born in 1929, 1929 was the year of the Great Depression. I believe it didn't start until about August of that year. So he was born 
right before the Great Depression hit the US. And I believe the Great Depression didn't end until about 1933. So that's when he was born. The interesting part that I honestly, honestly, it's funny because you learn about him in school, at least in the US you learn about Martin Luther King Jr. in school and they talk about him in very, very general terms. You don't get too much information about his background most of the time. So when I researched him and I sincerely apologize if any of the information I give is inaccurate, but I followed the sources that I happened to find and his name is not originally Martin Luther King Jr. What's funny was when I was in school, I noticed Martin Luther was in his name. It's funny because I had known Martin Luther to be famous for his 95 theses. So Martin Luther was accredited to starting the Protestant Reformation. What he had done, at least originally, that eventually sparked the Protestant Reformation is he created what's called the 95 Theses. And he wrote essentially 95 reasons, 95 things that the church needs to do better, essentially. Mainly he wrote these because the Roman Catholic Church at that time was taking advantage, particularly of their poor parishioners. So there was something called indulgences and indulgences essentially was a fee. So the church said, if you pay us money, your sins will be absolved. And also not only will your sin be forgiven, but you can pay a fee for your deceased loved ones if they're in purgatory. So essentially there's hell where the bad people go. There's purgatory, which is kind of the in-between and then there's heaven. So if you're in purgatory, there's hope for you. Essentially, you suffer to purge yourself of all your, your earthly sins, and then you can ascend into heaven. So if you paid the church indulgences for your dead loved ones, you could, in theory, <laughs> shorten the time that your loved ones are in purgatory and you'd help them ascend into heaven faster. So he did not think that was right. <laughs> I totally agree and he said something about it. He tacked on his 95 theses onto the door and it started a revolution. Now Martin Luther King Jr.'s father was a pastor, was a minister, reverend. I'm not exactly sure what term to you properly used. In the sources I had seen, I didn't like that they used, some of them used pastor, reverend, like minister, interchangeably. I don't believe they're interchangeable. However, I didn't look into it too deeply, so my apologies if I say the wrong term. But his father took over his grandfather's, his maternal grandfather's church. And when he had done that, in I believe 1934, if my sources are correct, he changed his name to be Martin Luther King Sr. And then he changed his son's name to be Martin Luther King Jr. Now, Martin Luther King Jr.'s original name was Michael King Jr. Some sources claim it was Michael Luther King Jr. I find that hard to believe because I don't see why it wouldn't be Martin to begin with. If Luther was in the name, I could be wrong, but most sources that I found said Michael King Jr. was his original birth name until his father changed his own name to Martin Luther King Sr. and then changed one of his son's names to Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the middle child, the second child of his parents. He had an older sister and a younger brother. Now, 
it was expected that young Martin would join the church, the Baptist church, like his father did and his grandfather before him. His family was very involved in religious matters, and he, it was expected that he, as the eldest son, would also become a pastor, a reverend, minister, whichever term is correct. Originally, from the sources, it says that he did not want that life originally. He actually wanted to be in academics. However, according to some of the sources, he was inspired to return to the religion and to become part of the church, a big part of the church, a reverend, whatever the term is. We'll go with reverend in the church after he took some Bible studies in college and he was inspired by his father and by certain professors who also were against racism and segregation that was happening during that time and who encouraged him to use Christianity and Christian teachings to lead people to social change. And eventually he did go to college. He did get a doctorate, hence Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He got a doctor in theology. And while he was at Boston University, which is where he obtained his doctorate, he met his wife, Coretta Scott, who obviously became Coretta Scott King, and she married him. And they had four children together, two boys and two girls. And if you look at some of the pictures of Martin Luther King Jr., you can see his family as well. Now, of course, the civil rights movement was a movement. So Martin Luther King Jr. was not the only person fighting for racial equality. He had many others before him, including his father, who were fighting for racial equality. According to one of my sources, his father and his grandfather were part of what was called the NAACP, which is an organization that still exists today. This stands for the National Association the advancement of colored people. So it stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And this organization still exists today. So his family was very against racial inequality. Unfortunately, they went through a lot of instances of racial inequality in their everyday lives. He had written letters and essays, even while he was in college at a very young age, against racial inequality. So he was already pretty active in it before adulthood. Like I said, because the research was a little wishy-washy with certain things, I'm not going to go over everything that happened in his life. Human beings are pretty complex, <laughs> and that's practically impossible to cover. However, I will very generally give you a little overview of some of the wonderful things that Dr. King has done. Now, he was involved in multiple organizations. He had actually found, helped found an organization of Southern churches to band the Southern Christian churches together to fight for racial equality in a peaceful manner. And Dr. King, according to the sources I found, was very influenced By Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Gandhi is very famous for 
being an activist himself. He believed in nonviolent ways to cause social change. He in particular, for example, had fought, fought peacefully for British rule to end in India, like native India. He did not believe in colonialism and he tried to abolish it through peaceful means. And Dr. King was very inspired by that. He had actually been to India and met with some of the leaders and it helped solidify his belief that nonviolent action was the best way to cause social change. Even in a lot of his speeches and sermons, he does mention that nonviolence essentially causes enough tension to make people realize, guess what, we need to change something. <laughs> we need to fix this. So even if you're being peaceful, it can still cause that tension, which it very much did in his lifetime, which I will explain a little bit about. Now just to give you context, Dr. King was very active in the 1950s and 1960s in the United States of America. At that time, as I'm sure many of you know, there was a lot of horrible <laughs> racial injustice going on. There was a lot more than just racial injustice, but since we're focusing on Dr. King, racial injustice was definitely there. There was a lot of segregation. There were even laws in place to keep black Americans down underneath white Americans. Now just to give a super, super quick background about potentially why that is, it's because for a very long time America had run on, at least the southern half of America in particular, had run on slavery and they used black Americans as their slaves to pick cotton because that was a grueling, terrible job. <laughs> and it made them a bunch of money to have workers who were not paid. Now, Abraham Lincoln had abolished slavery in the 1860s with his Emancipation Proclamation. He had created the Emancipation Proclamation which decreed that federally there will be no slaves, the slaves are free. Which is wonderful, however, essentially there were a bunch of black Americans who now were like, well, now what, where do we go, what do we do? They were, most of them were kept uneducated, who would give them a job, that kind of thing. So there was a, a lot of terrible drawbacks for black Americans at that time and there were some black Americans particularly very educated ones such as Dr. King who wanted racial inequality to end now there are numerous ways in which Mr. King was a very influential civil rights activist he was, a civil, he was considered a civil rights leader. One of the best tools that he had was his speech, his words. His words were influential. He gave, he wrote and gave beautiful sermons and speeches to thousands of people, <laughs> multiple times, <laughs> quite a few times. So what he, some examples of what he had done was he would be a part of and or organize various marches. There was something called the March on Washington, which had occurred where they went to the Lincoln Memorial. And remember, Abraham Lincoln was the one who made the Emancipation Proclamation, ending slavery. And on, during the March on Washington is when Mr. King delivered his one of his most famous and well-known speeches which is the I Have a Dream speech, which really ended up bringing him to fame. He also did marches such as for the march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. There were multiple attempts to 
to do that march and they had to cross this particular bridge but the first time they had tried to cross the bridge Martin Luther King Jr. was not part of that march but it became violent the police uh, caused some brutality to happen against the demonstrators there was also a second attempt was thwarted when legally there was a restraining order not allowing people to go to the other side the third time from what my sources claim martin luther king jr decided to join but he didn't want to break the restraining order so instead what he did was he marched across with a bunch of people thousands and thousands of people when they reached the barricades and the police officers they knelt in prayer <laughs> in front of them and then turned back from the bridge and left and lyndon b johnson had helped them to get, he ordered the U.S. Army and the National Guard to help them cross the bridge safely. Another president had helped him out, actually, too, when earlier on. He had Martin Luther King Jr. because of his activism and the act of racism against Black Americans and against any kind of civil unrest. He was arrested many times during his lifetime. I could not find an exact number. Different sources told me a different number of times he was jailed. However, it's documented that he's been jailed quite a few times. And in, during one instance when he was jailed, one of the presidential candidates at the time, John F. Kennedy, he actually called Coretta Scott King, so his wife, and talked to her and was saying that it was not right that he was jailed. And he actually advocated to get Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King out of jail, <laughs> which happened. And it is, it is said that that's actually why John F. Kennedy won the presidency. That's one of the reasons is because he advocated for Dr. King at the time. Now, besides marches, numerous marches throughout his lifetime, he also participated in sit-ins. Now a sit-in, in this case, was when sit-ins had happened, just like marches, happened before Martin Luther King Jr. He's not the only one that did it. Once again, it's a movement, so he's not the only one involved. There's many, many thousands of people who were involved in these movements all across the country. So he had participated in what was called a sit-in. Sit-ins in this case, because blacks and whites were forced to be segregated. So the blacks had to sit with the blacks, the whites had to sit with the whites, and because it was racism, the blacks always got the worst spots and the whites got the best spots. Now, in the sit-ins, there were particularly college students who decided to, when they had lunch, that they were not going to sit in their designated area. Instead, they would intermingle with the whites. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. had participated in at least one of these sit-ins with, I believe, if my sources are correct, 75 college students. And what ended up happening was, unfortunately, because racism was so deeply rooted and people don't like change, <laughs> generally speaking. Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested again, as were at least 35 of the demonstrators with him. Also, what happens very often is there's a lot of brutality that happens against them. So even though he is peaceful in his demonstrations, his marches, his speeches, etc., even though he's peaceful, people did not react to him peacefully. That doesn't mean that every white person was terrible and awful to everybody. That's like with anything in this world, it's not. Nothing's really 100% for the most part. So there were white sympathizers, people, white people who did agree that racial equality should be a thing. So please try not to fall for the all or nothing mentality it's not true it's just like with anything even all blacks aren't all for equality either and i'm not trying to demonize anyone i'm just saying that's human nature 
certain people, they just believed what they were taught. And they were like, hey, we're lesser, whatever. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want my family to get killed. I don't want to get hurt. Whatever their reason, they may not fight. And it's just the same thing with the whites. Just because whites are considered the bad guys doesn't mean all of them are <laughs> at all. So please bear that in mind. And Martin Luther King Jr. did appeal to white sympathizers as well during his speeches. Now, so he did marches, he did sit-ins, of course. He did his speeches. His speeches were highly inspirational. I'll say speeches slash sermons, because he did both. Because once again, he was a reverend, minister, whatever you want to call it. Or whatever it's properly called. So he's very well known for his speeches and his sermons. He did a great job inspiring others. to fight for racial equality. Besides marches, sit-ins, speeches, and sermons, he also helped with boycotting. Now, boycotting is essentially when you refuse to do something because you don't agree with it. So in this case, for example, one of the first ways that Martin Luther King Jr. really started to show up publicly against racism and started to be more in the in the national limelight was when he participated in the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, if you had learned about this in school, you probably remember Rosa Parks. I will explain a little bit about her and about somebody else that you may never have heard of ever. Or you may have. Depends. But I had not heard of her until I did my research. Now, like I said, there was segregation. So the blacks were supposed to be at the back of the bus and the whites were supposed to be at the front of the bus because it takes longer to walk to the back as the front. So if you're tired after a day of work, the white people can just sit down. Black people have to walk all the way back and sit back there. However, if the bus is full and more white people come onto the bus, the blacks were expected to get up and give their seats up to the white people. It didn't matter how tired the blacks were, it did not matter. The whites are gonna sit down. That's essentially how it was. And there were some people that were like, well, I'm not gonna get up. <laughs> so there was one woman, a very young woman, who I had not heard about because I always heard that Rosa Parks was the one who said, no, I'm not going to get up when she was told to. Now, this young woman, her name was Claudette Coleman. Now, Miss Claudette Coleman was a 15-year-old teenager who was on the bus, and she was told, among several other black Americans to get up so that the whites could sit down because the bus was full. She refused to get up and she was arrested as a result. Now, Miss Claudette Colvin was not talked about according to one of my sources because she was pregnant at the time. So she was a pregnant 15 year old girl and that organization I told you about, the NAACP, didn't think that using her as a rallying cry would work because of Christian values, so having intimate relations outside of wedlock was a no-no, her being so young and having a child was a no-no, she didn't look the part that they wanted, whatever it was, if my source is correct, they decided not to use her as a rallying cry because they wanted a boycott of the buses, but they needed someone to be the face of it. Essentially, they needed a push to make people angry enough to want a boycott. They decided not to use her, which is why you don't hear about her, <laughs> but she exists. And she was before Rosa Parks. Now, if you have not heard of Rosa Parks, I will explain a little bit about her. 
So Miss Rosa Parks was, according to my sources, a 42-year-old young woman who was a member of the NAACP. After a grueling day of work, she had gone on the bus and she was at the front of the black section. The bus got full, she was told get up, and she said no. <laughs> she was arrested and she also was fined for that. And the NAACP used her as their rallying cry to start the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, the bun, they had asked Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to be the face of the boycott. So he had joined this boycott, and essentially the boycott was for over a year, and the black Americans didn't go on the bus, they walked to and from work instead and they unfortunately were harassed and maltreated for boycotting the bus. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., according to my sources, had written five books during his lifetime. And um, some essays were published as well, particularly after his death. But one of the books, his very first book was a memoir and it was around that Montgomery bus boycott and explaining what happened and his role in it. There was during, while he was autographing his book, in one of his speeches he mentioned, there was a woman who came up to him and asked, are you Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? He said yes, without looking up, he was just finishing what he was doing. And she stabbed him with a letter opener. That was the first assassination attempt on his life. She ended up stabbing him so hard that it almost hit his aorta in his heart, the main artery in his heart. And it was said in the media that if he had sneezed, he would have died. And he mentioned in one of his speeches the most beautiful thing. He said, out of all the letters that he received regarding that incident, he loved this one letter by a young high schooler who said that she had heard about what happened to him and she said she was glad that he didn't sneeze <laughs> and I thought that was the cutest thing <laughs> not the assassination attempt but the fact that this young white woman was on his side <laughs> and she let him know that I think that that's heartwarming you know it probably felt good because he went through like many many people at that time, particularly black Americans, he went through a lot, a lot of people who hated him, <laughs> straight up. And it probably felt good to know somebody cared and wanted him to exist in the world, you know what I mean? To continue his mission. And that's beautiful. So, he did his marches, sit-ins, speeches, and sermons, his boycotts. He also wrote some famous letters for example, when he was in jail, in a Birmingham jail, he wrote a very famous letter while he was there. So his letters are all so influential. Essentially, his words are one of his biggest impacts, even today. He has beautiful, beautiful quotations. His speeches are lovely. I did review some of his speeches and some of his sermons, and they are very well done. He also participated in demonstrations as well. I would kind of link that in with the marches there, but in the speeches, that's usually kind of how it worked. But he did quite a bit in his lifetime. Now, this is a, just a very general overview. He did a lot. <laughs> he did a lot. So if you're interested in him, I would definitely recommend looking him up. Just please be mindful of the sources that you're looking at. Every, every source has its own agenda, so just bear that in mind. I did look through multiple websites and I compared the information I was given. It, well, sometimes it matched, sometimes it didn't. So it really, it depends on what you're looking at, really. Like I mentioned before, he was in a bunch of organizations and helped founded some organizations as well to help fight for equality, 
in a very non-violent fashion. Also, because of so, the so many things that he participated in and that he wrote about and that he spoke about to people, inspired them into action, he helped cause two major acts to occur in the United States. One of them was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Sorry, my handwriting's terrible. <laughs> it's the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which essentially said that racism is illegal, segregation is illegal. Everybody, regardless of race, religion, etc., everyone's equal, essentially, by law. There was also the Voting Right, the Voting Act. So he helped Black Americans gain the right to vote as well. He did quite a bit, and he was quite influential. Now, I do want to say, though, he is accredited with being a huge advocate of civil rights. Like, of course, he did a lot of work around civil rights, and he deserves to be recognized for that, hence Martin Luther King Jr. Day. However, civil rights are not the only things he was advocating for at all. He wanted, from what I understand from his speeches and sermons, he wanted So among other things, some of what he was advocating for besides civil rights was equality for all, so that it does include civil rights for black Americans. But the thing is, a lot of people I feel don't understand that when you're trying to advocate for something, sometimes you can go, so if the, the scales aren't balanced, right, sometimes people go the other way. So it's still not equal, it's still not balanced. If you're fighting so much for one thing that it throws everything out of whack again instead of meeting in the middle. So, for example, fighting for civil rights doesn't mean that we're saying blacks are better than whites. It's also not saying that other races don't matter. So, he didn't, from what I saw, he didn't particularly mention other races, but he does mention equality for all, which does mean other races. So, when you think of racism, so often people think of blacks versus whites. That isn't true in the sense that there are other races that exist and equality should be amongst them all. So a lot of the times other races get lost in the shuffle instead of thinking of all the races, it's always just black and white, which is inaccurate. And it's ironic that it's black and white because when you think in black and white, <laughs> it's so literal, right? And there's so much gray in the world. We have Asians in the world. We have Alaskan Natives. We have Native Americans. We have so, we have Latinos. We have so many different races in the world. Not, even in the United States, we're a melting pot, right? Where there's so many different types of people. It's not just blacks versus whites. So he advocated for equality for everyone, which is beautiful. He also, like I mentioned before with Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi, he was for non-violent civil change. So to cause a change in the world, he advocated for being non-violent about it, even if you were met with violence. So even though there were a lot of police brutality, a lot of these poor people were hosed, they were beaten, they were 
they were threatened. Like for instance, Martin Luther King Jr. besides the first assassination attempt, his home was bombed after the Montgomery bus boycott. So his family was in danger, not just him. That's scary. <laughs> okay, that's scary. But even with all those attempts on his life, he still wanted nonviolent change. That's pretty powerful. <laughs> that's pretty powerful. He also, especially near the end of his life, he advocated for other things besides civil rights. He advocated for anti-war, essentially, especially Vietnam. So at the time, the Vietnam War was happening. And he wrote some speeches about it, saying essentially that the Vietnam War is wrong. We're stopping the Vietnamese people from being free. Isn't America supposed to be all about freedom? Why are we stopping them? Why are we sending our people, blacks and white, to fight in Vietnam for the Vietnamese not to be free? And why are we having our people die for that? And even when, especially when blacks and whites can't even sit together, and yet you are expecting them to fight together and die together. So he was against war, which links in with his nonviolent nature. And he also advocated for helping the poor. He mentioned once, at least once that I saw, that the Vietnam, the Vietnam War was causing resources to be pulled out of what normally would have gone to the poor. So he said, the poor were starting to finally get acknowledged. People were giving to the poor. There were organizations to help the poor. And then all of a sudden, all of those funds got taken away to support the war effort and fighting and weapons and to send people over to fight in Vietnam. So all the resources were pulled to help the Vietnam War effort as opposed to helping the people back at home. He met a lot, a lot of resistance particularly when he started focusing on other aspects of peace and civil change that needed to happen. So he was for civil change for the rights of all people, even those who are economically disadvantaged. He did not just advocate for civil rights, although he is well known for his civil rights, he advocated for other things, and once he started, particularly once he started advocating for those other things, a lot of people turned against him. Even the people that had been with him originally turned against him for what he stood for. A lot of people also were getting angry because they felt that his non-violent way of doing things was not effective. They thought you had to smash some heads to get change to happen. Because if you smash someone's head, they're going to think better, right? <laughs> That's the way. Yeah, okay. I believe you. <laughs> but they didn't like how slow change was happening. So, they so a lot of people called a lot of violent ways to try to get civil rights. There was a movement. There was a term at the time called Black Power. It was something that he had written against Black Power. He had mentioned that he does not agree with Black Power. He thinks it's not right to think that. Like I was saying with the scales. So essentially, if you were thinking Black Power, you're saying the, you're essentially saying the white, the blacks are more powerful than the whites, and that's still inequality. It's still not equal. It's still wrong. So he was advocating against black power. However, he liked the idea. He mentioned that what he didn't advocate for originally, that he didn't really think to advocate for, but that he does agree with, with the black power, is to empower people, especially, especially the blacks, to think of themselves as worthy to be equal, thinking of themselves as equal because if you don't think you're equal you're gonna act lower than somebody else even though you're not lower than somebody else so he agreed with the psychological aspect of black power but he did not agree with how it was done and what it was saying to people besides that now we get to a very sad <laughs> time so he had that first assassination attempt he did live after that, however, according to one of my sources, he was 
going to go to a motel. He was told that his family and he were in danger. There was an assassination attempt that someone was going to try on them. And they were told to go to a motel. And But there was a sick family member, so his family didn't come with him. He went alone to this motel. He delivered that beautiful speech that I told you about. I've come to the mountaintop. He actually said that speech a day before he died. Now, I read the speech. I really enjoyed it. He, all, pretty much a lot of the speeches and his sermons, because obviously he was a minister, a reverend, whatever, whatever the word is, he used a lot of Christian beliefs, so he would equate the struggle of the black Americans to biblical passages, such as the when the Jews were held back by the Egyptians way back when, when Moses led the people to be free uh, to the promised land. And he mentioned that in this particular speech. He was essentially saying, he said near the end of his speech, that even if he does not get to the end of this movement, as in, even if he doesn't see full equality, he says he's seen the promised land. He sees where this can go. And it doesn't matter if he doesn't get there kind of thing. Unfortunately, on April 4th, 1968, a day after that speech was given, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated by a sniper while he was on his balcony at that motel. However, his legacy definitely goes on, <laughs> hence why we celebrate him. There actually is a website completely dedicated to him. I believe his wife really spearheaded that. I believe she founded an organization in his name. She also advocated for his day. And she, they made a statue of him. Now my printer, Unfortunately, was running out of ink, so I'm sorry about the quality. But look how cool that is. In Washington, D.C., so in the capital of the United States, there is this big chunk of stone, 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 and this piece in the middle, and it, right where that piece was, there's Martin Luther King Jr. How beautiful is that? And on the side of his beautiful statue commemorating him it says out of the mountain of despair a stone arose so there's despair that mountain and then boom there's martin luther king jr to save the day that's so cute <laughs> i did not know there was a statue commemorating him actually as sad as that is but that's a beautiful statue in his honor What was interesting about his last speech as well that I noticed was in some of the other speeches and sermons I had read from him, it didn't mention really actionable steps that the average person could do to fight racism. However, in this speech, he, <laughs> he literally told black Americans and white sympathizers, whoever sympathized with the racial movement, the civil rights movement, to take actionable steps to show they're disgruntled with civil with this civil inequality for example he mentioned certain companies such as the coca-cola company that were not treating black americans well so he said don't buy their products well, hit them where it hurts hit them economically don't buy their products they don't treat you right don't buy their products don't give them your money he said even though we're the poorest collectively we're the richest so essentially the rich are getting rich off the poor so he's saying don't give them your money <laughs> you can choose not to give them your money he also said there were certain banks that didn't treat african americans correctly so he said take your money out of those banks put them in this bank instead that actually treats us correctly like human beings he literally advocated for that, and I thought that was hilarious. I don't know if that was him just trying to really broaden 
what the average person could do. So if, for instance, you couldn't go to the demonstration or you didn't want to because you didn't want to get attacked, you didn't want your family to get hurt, anything like that, you didn't have the time, whatever it was, you could still take actionable steps in your own personal life, simple steps to show that you're not going to take this anymore <laughs> and that this isn't right. So I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the best things about history and learning about history is that it's important to remember that we're all people. So all those people in history, including Martin Luther King Jr., are people. And what I mean by that is they're human beings and they make mistakes. Right? So there was an FBI investigation, Martin Luther King Jr. Now the FBI was investigating, so the Federal Bureau of Investigation was investigating a lot of different people. However, of course, because he gained national fame and he was such a strong leader in the civil rights movement and he was so well known, he was considered a threat. So there was an FBI investigation, according to one of the sources, this investigation was meant to discredit him so that he looked bad in the eyes of the people. Now, I do not know how true this investigation truly was, if any of what they said has merit. What they claim to have found is that he was cheating on his wife with multiple people, that he had multiple affairs and that he potentially had ties with communists and that he was fraternizing with the communists. Now bear in mind, the investigation was meant to discredit him, to make him look bad in the eyes of the public so people wouldn't follow him anymore and it would help hinder the movement or stop it completely by discrediting one of the major leaders. Now, I do have to say, even if it is true, and I don't know what's true, like I said, even the information I gave you, I hope is true, but if it isn't, I apologize very much. I apologize for that. I can only go, I don't, I, I didn't live during that time. I don't know what's true. <laughs> and even if you live during a time, sometimes you don't know what's going on, but whatever, it's fine. Anywho, main thing is, even if the adultery was true, let's say, let's take that one. Even if that's true, that's a personal issue. Now, I'm not saying it's right to cheat on people. It definitely is not. I 100% don't agree with that, okay? However, even if it was true that he was a womanizer, that doesn't discredit him. And this is why. It doesn't take away from what he achieved in his life. He endangered his life and his family's life. And so, so many times, he's had so many scares on his life and potentially on his family's life. He took those crazy risks that so many people aren't brave enough to take. He was brave enough to take those risks for what he believed was right. That is a strong person. Even if, even if it's true that he committed adultery, it does not take away from his contribution to society. It does not take away. I also, a very modern example of that would be, I did not look into this, but I've heard about this. So I'm going just by word of mouth. I don't know how true, I don't know how true this is, but there is an actor who was accused by his girlfriend or his wife, I'm not sure who it is, of, beating her okay but he was saying no she's abusive to me so it's a he said she said just reason okay so someone just because someone's accused of something does not mean they're guilty unfortunately especially when the media says somebody's guilty oh my gosh they're accused of that they did this <sighs> please use your brain if they're accused that doesn't mean they're guilty that's somebody else pointing the finger at them and saying, you did this to me, or you did this to this person, or whatever the case may be. Being accused doesn't mean you did it. 
And even if you did do it, right, this actor is a phenomenal actor. That's his job. He's a great actor. Why should he... S there are actually... I have been told, like I said, I didn't verify this, I didn't fact check, but I have been told that he's having trouble getting into movies because no one wants that his reputation now to hinder anything. They don't want it to ruin the movie or anything like that, so they kind of cut ties with him. But that's so wrong, though. He's a good actor. He does a good job with his job. His personal life and what he was accused of is not doesn't affect how good an actor he is. So why would you harm him professionally because of an accusation that may or may not be true? And even if it was true, that's his personal life. Why does his personal life affect his job? That's just my opinion, but <laughs> I'm clearly impassioned about it. But it's just, in America, the thought is, in our justice system, it's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, but so often I see anytime anyone's accused of something, immediately they're guilty. And that's wrong. That's just wrong. So I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> But I did want to say a little bit about activism and activists in general, too. Now, like we saw with Martin Luther King Jr. and what we saw with Claudette not being given the credit of being one of the first to boycott the bus, Rosa Parks was used instead. Just like with that, there, like I said before with sources, too, everyone has their agenda, has their own reasons for doing things. Now, <sighs> Martin Luther King Jr. has been used throughout his lifetime as a leader, as a fi the face, essentially, of civil rights and the civil rights movement. He's used nowadays for different organizations as well. Different buildings have his name in his honor. So a lot of people use him as a figurehead. Now, that happens with a lot of activists, not just... Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., people will use their name, their face to kind of legitimize whatever message that organization is trying to convey, whether rightly or wrongly. So he is no exception when it comes to that as an activist. He is used in that way. Also, another thing people tend to do with activism or with anything, really, is whenever they're seen as doing this one single thing like for instance he is the face of civil rights the face of civil rights however he was telling people no i'm not the face of civil rights i believe in this 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 and this nonviolent civil change doing the right thing essentially i believe in doing the right thing so he went against war he went for helping the poor etc it wasn't just civil rights but the second he says it's not just civil rights, people turn on him. That happens a lot with activists, unfortunately. So, for example, I'm going to give a weird... <laughs> I'm going to give a couple of weird examples. One is, if you've ever read the Hunger Games trilogy. So, in the Hunger Games, if you don't know the story, it's an apocalyptic series. And the main character, the protagonist's name is Katniss Everdeen. Now, I believe it was in the third book, I want to say. She was used, second or third, or both, I can't remember, I'm sorry. But eventually, over time, because she had rebelled against the government, mainly to protect her sister, people used her as a figurehead. They used her name and her face just like people use his name and his face to promote their own agendas. So people, there was a rebellion against the government and they used her as the rallying cry, as the martyr, essentially, to make people want to follow her. They used her as the leader because, unfortunately, with human beings in general, they kind of need a leader with things. It's nice to have somebody kind of taking the responsibility and being the face and telling us what to do, essentially, is kind of what it is. And they used her for that, just like he was used for that as well. Now, that's not to say he was just used his whole life and didn't think for himself. Of course, he wrote these beautiful speeches and sermons, and he was part of these demonstrations because he wanted 
change for the better. So I'm, that's, I'm not trying to diminish what he's done by any means. I'm just saying you have to be wary of people who use activists as figureheads, as leaders for whatever their agenda is, which may not align with what that person believed in at the time. So I highly recommend reading his speeches, hearing him speak and his sermons. So you hear from his mouth and his words what he believed in. Now, obviously anyone can lie and it, that kind of thing. I'm not saying he lied, but I'm saying take everything you read and hear with a grain of salt. Everything. <laughs> because you don't know who's telling the truth sometimes, right? But I do like his speeches. I don't agree. I'm not going to lie. I don't agree with everything. And I'm not saying that I, I agree with racism. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that he, he likened everything to like religious things. So it got a little extreme. I can see the propaganda in what he says. And I understand why he did it. I'm not saying I don't understand. I do. I understand why he did it to make people inspired, to get them inspired to change things the way they are because it's difficult to uproot people and to, to change the norm the social norms of the time i completely get that but i do see the propaganda in him that's why i'm a little yeah <laughs> although the speeches themselves are beautiful he has some brilliant words he was a master wordsmith for sure for sure the other weird example i wanted to give i'm getting back on track sorry so the other weird thing i wanted to mention was for example if you don't do what that one thing people want you to be, or the th one thing they think you're the face of, you're the poster child of. For example, I noticed with country singers, people who sing country songs, they, whenever they try a different genre of music, so maybe hip hop, or they try R&B, or just anything besides country, there's almost always and ever a huge backlash. Like, why would you be disloyal to country by not saying country anymore? And that's wrong because it's good to branch out. I give him so many props for saying, you know what? I'm not just the face of civil rights. I believe in civil rights 150%. I believe in equality for everyone. But... I also believe in nonviolence. I believe that the poor should be taken care of, that we should take care of our own people. We need to care for our own people. We have to do what is right. And I commend him highly for that. This poor man went through so much. Anyone who's, who's famous, right? Anybody who's famous in the public limelight. Anyone who all, even if you're not nationally, internationally known, whatever it is, if you go against the norm, almost inevitably you're getting backlash. Somebody is mad at you. <laughs> Someone's mad. You just made someone really angry. And here's the thing. It's amazing that we have strong people like Dr. King who still do it anyway. Like, for example, the, um, a modern activist now is Malala. I'm not even going to attempt her last name because I don't know how to say it. I'm sorry. But her name is Malala. And this Malala was on the bus one day and she was shot in the face. Shot to kill in the face by people who didn't want her activism. She was fighting for education for women in particular she wants essentially education to be equal for all but she noticed women are not given the right to education like they should particularly in her country and she got shot for it someone tried to kill her for it her dad was an activist as well her dad ended up kind of backing away for a while for activism after his daughter got shot because he was like oh my god my daughter got shot like my, i need to keep my family safe which I completely get. I completely get that. But Miss Malala, when she recovered, she still advocates for education for all, and especially for women. She still does it. And she got shot in the face. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. And him, he got stabbed with a letter opener. People in the heart. He almost 
just died. He got his home, got destroyed, got bombed just because he boycotted a bus. Like, this man's amazing. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. I like when you learn about history and it becomes so human because history is humanity. It's humans doing what they do, being human. And when we have extraordinary humans, such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. leading the way for other people to do the right thing, that's amazing. You have to kind of stand back in awe and be like, wow, <laughs> I wish I was like that. And guess what? We can be like that. But it's challenging. It's so challenging. It's dangerous, really, because there's always that creep that's going to come get you. But we still have beautiful people like him that still do it, that still fight. And here's the thing, of course, because he's considered like the figurehead, the face of civil rights, even though he believed in much more than that and doing the right thing and nonviolence, which is beautiful. That's difficult to do. Like when people are attacking you and you, you want to punch them in the face, but you don't, you know, <laughs> that takes strength. That takes a lot of strength. So his nonviolent methods are very admirable. But it takes so much strength to say, I believe this is wrong and I want it changed. And I think I can safely say that a lot of people want it to be changed. He had at least, I believe one of the marches, 20,000 people or one of his speeches, I can't remember what it was, but if it was, it was about 20,000 people there. 20,000 people, <laughs> that's a lot of people. So, of course, keep bear in mind, once again, it's a movement. So he's not the only one that was brave. He's not the only one that risked his life, that got attacked, that got jailed. He's not the only one. He's just, he is famous for it, yes. And I'm not diminishing his contributions to society, particularly American society. Not at all. I'm just saying, remember the unsung heroes, too. Just like he, he got a bunch of letters when he had that, when that first assassination attempt happened, he had a bunch of letters and he mentioned in one of his speeches slash sermons that he got letters from very famous people, so big people in politics and such. That high schooler who said, I'm glad you didn't sneeze, that was what stuck with him. That's what stuck with him. So just because you're famous or whatever it is, it doesn't mean that you're the only one that matters. So please bear that in mind. Also, I was very, very fortunate in my education that one of my majors when I was in college, I only have a bachelor's degree, but when I was in college, I had two majors and one of them was history. And I learned so much from history. The funny part is when you learn about history, <laughs> even in the history major itself, like we would joke that you're never gonna get a job <laughs> studying history, and yet we did it anyway. History, I would, if I was gonna advocate for anything, one of the biggest things I would advocate for, besides education in general, for everyone, and literacy would be history, learning about history. I noticed in American, at least where I live in America, education really focuses on literacy, or they claim they focus on literacy, I'm not going to go too much into that, my thoughts on that, but what I noticed is they're also going STEM or STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, or science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. However, even with the arts and STEAM, it's so rare when they talk about history. It's like they gloss it over and they don't want to discuss history. That's dangerous. Not discussing history is dangerous. Just like I said with this, because I learned history and I was fortunate enough to have that as my major, I learned one of the best skills you can have, in my opinion, which is learning how to think for yourself. Now, I'm not saying I'm a genius or anything like that at all. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I was taught how to analyze situations, how to analyze written documents from different time periods, written in different ways. Something is very complex and thick, hard to read, cumbersome documents, and you can cut it apart. 
and analyze all of it and you can see okay this person wants me to feel this way that's why they omitted that information and I know because I studied history that that existed that happened but they didn't mention it because they didn't want you to know that happened so it's good to know if they omit something maybe they don't want you to know something that could affect your opinion maybe they want to get a rile out of you they want to get your, your emotions going they want the common man to get angry or to, to get do a certain action that they want you to do when you learn history you do get empowered you get empowered now like i said history is <laughs> you gotta be careful where you get your information from that's that goes with any discipline it's hard to know what's real what's true and what's not you have to use your discernment especially with really far back history it's hard to know what's true historians have to piece together what they can based on the artifacts they have the documents primary secondary whatever it is tertiary any whatever documents they have available to them maybe there was a war and a lot of things were destroyed unfortunately that does happen <laughs> that's so sad but yeah so yeah they have to do the best they can but you also have to bear in mind even historians have their own agendas like i remember learning in school there were these two historians in particular who would fight each other so they tried to best each other in their historical dissertations and in their theses and things like that so like oh there's pettiness in, in everything you know so really it's just trying to be aware and use your best judgment and knowing how to analyze things and to not always take everything at face value essentially no matter what you read what you study that's just my spiel on history there we go <laughs> I think we can safely thank Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for his beautiful contributions, for his bravery, his bravery, in fighting for what he believed in even when others didn't want him to fight for it, and for fighting in the most peaceful way. For his beautiful words that he left us with beautiful examples of how you can fight for what's right in a peaceful manner even when others aren't being peaceful i like to think of it as if someone is in the darkness right let's say ignorance we'll call ignorance darkness so if you're in the dark right and you've been in the dark a long time when the light is shined on you right by people such as dr martin luther king jr it hurts your eyes, doesn't it? The second the light hits your eyes, your eyes dilate, they get bigger, and it hurts. Originally, it hurts, and sometimes it hurts for a while. So the first reaction for pretty much everybody is shut the light off, make the light stop, right? They don't say, oh, let me cover my eyes and like slowly adjust to the light. I'm gonna adjust to this eventually. No, that's not the thought. The first thought is shut the light off, make it stop, make the pain stop. So it's kind of like when a light like this comes into the world, there will always be people who are still in the dark who will fight to stay in the dark. That goes for anything. <laughs> Absolutely anything in the world. It's a very human thing to do. It's not, obviously, it's not right to assassinate people. Or it's not right to harm them in any way, shape, or form. But the feeling of wanting to harm someone, especially when you disagree very strongly with them, is a very human emotion. It's a very human thing. I don't agree with stabbing people with letter openers or shooting them or anything like that. Just shooting them down with hoses and crazy things and just awful things. But it is hard to change your mindset sometimes too. So I'm not justifying what the wrongs people have done. But I am just trying to kind of play devil's, devil's advocate to show you several sides of the situation so that you can make your own decisions based on the information I give you although I strongly encourage you if you're interested at least read or hear and or hear some of his speeches and sermons maybe to commemorate him during Martin Luther King Jr. Day or just any time of the year kind of educate yourself about him if you wish learn about his life a little bit just always keep in mind about those sources and the credibility of it what's their agenda that kind of thing but, yeah, that's Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> that is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So 
who you think him so help me for his beautiful contribution for people like him in the past in the present and people in the future who advocate for what's right i do want to caution you again for something else this time sorry my legs hurt oh i do want to caution you that not everything that people advocate for is right not every activist is uh, uh, trying to get good things to happen once again you have to use your discernment always keep in mind we all have agendas we all do but not everybody's agenda is a good one <laughs> so you have to use your own discernment your own judgment if you decide to be part of a movement or even be an activist yourself is what you're going for worth it is do you truly believe that this is the way this is the right thing to do that kind of thing and i'm not discouraging people from activism i think you should speak your mind and say what you believe but there is a way to do it and there's a way not to do it i don't i personally don't agree with the violent way of doing things i don't think smashing someone's heads in is going to help them think better but change is difficult to make in any time period particularly like i said when it's deeply rooted like it was in back in the 1950s and 60s during the civil rights movement it is ironic though how he was fighting against the vietnam war now the vietnam war i believe if i'm not mistaken i believe i learned this where the vietnam war was the first televised war so tv television was becoming more mainstream it was cheaper now so more people middle class etc could afford a television set and they could watch the news shows whatever was on the tv and that was the first time people really saw images the horror of war where it was photographed some terrible battle scenes were just shown to the public and i believe vietnam war was one of the wars where really people really saw the horror of the war because if you think about it in like world war one world war two especially world war one there were so many young people who actually wanted to be in the war because they thought it was all sensationalized and wow i'm gonna be a hero etc they didn't know how disgusting war is how dirty you are in it they didn't know how painful it was gonna be and how tough it was gonna be which is terrible but being televised the vietnam war really showed that to people to the public so it's funny that he was advocating for that war to stop and then all of a sudden after that there, there are other wars after that one obviously but it really showed people that they need to care for their veterans and that they that war is hell essentially <laughs> but yeah that is our wonderful dr martin luther king jr and we thank him humbly for his beautiful bravery and for people like him who actively speak up and who are brave and who try to make the world a better place